Hello everyone, this is Munisa, and I welcome you all to my today's session. Today we are going to have a discussion regarding IS 36, that is International Accounting Standard number 36, Impairment of Assets. Let us start our discussion by having a look at the objective of IS 36. Students, IS 36 itself says that its objective is to set rules to ensure that the assets of an entity are carried at no more than their recoverable amount. It simply means that at proper intervals, we need to compare the carrying amount of an asset with the recoverable amount and wherever it seems that carrying amount of an asset is more than the recoverable amount, it's determined that an impairment is existing. Carrying amount is an amount at which the assets are shown on the face of the balance sheet or SOFP of an organization. Every one of us is pretty much clear that carrying amount is the cost of an asset less accumulated depreciation over the period of time. At any time, if we do see that the carrying amount of an asset is more than the recoverable amount, we need to consider impairment as per the rules set by IS 36. Now the point here to consider is that what is a recoverable amount? As per IS 36, the recoverable amount is greater of fair value, less cost to sell, and value in use. So whichever is greater among these two figures will be considered as a recoverable amount. And then this recoverable amount has to be compared with the carrying amount. And if we see that recoverable amount is lesser than the carrying amount, Impairment is existing as per the rules prescribed by IS 36. Let us consider that what is fair value and what is a value in use. Students, fair value is basically known to be as the market value of an asset. So wherever the active market is existing for an asset, we will be considering that particular market value as the fair value of an asset. On the other hand, if we do have any kind of binding sale agreement with any customer, with any purchaser, that decided sale amount can be considered as the fair value of an asset. From that fair value, we need to deduct all of the costs which are necessary to sell the asset and then we need to consider the value in use of an asset too. What is the value in use, students? As its name is suggesting, that value in use is the total value of the cash inflows and outflows netted off and the value of the ultimate disposal proceeds. These total cash flows has to be discounted at the present value in order to calculate the value in use. So we can simply say that what is a value in use? It is the present value of all the future cash flows which can arise by using the particular asset under consideration. You also need to consider that the cash flows which are arising, which are incurring due to the financing activities or any kind of income taxes are not going to be included in value in use. So whichever is going to be greater among pure value less cost to sell, and value in use will be considered as the recoverable amount. 
And this recoverable amount has to be compared with the carrying amount. And if we see that recoverable amount is lesser than the carrying amount, impairment exists as per IS 36. Let us have a look at this illustration, students. The requirement of this question, if you can see it's written in the bold form, what is the recoverable amount of each asset? And then we are required to calculate the impairment loss for each of the three assets. So in this given illustration, we do have three assets, namely A, B, and C. And for these three assets, we are being given with the carrying amounts, their net realizable value, and value in use. Students, net realizable value is also known as fair value less cost to sell. So first we are required to calculate the recoverable amount of each asset. What is a recoverable amount? As I've told earlier, recoverable amount is greater of fair value less cost to sell, that is NRV, net realizable value, and value in use. So for asset number A, which one is greater among NRV and value in use? It is value in use, that is $120,000. For asset B, which is greater among NRV and value in use? It is value in use, that is $130,000, considered as a recoverable amount. For asset C, which one is greater among NRV and value in use? It is NRV, which will be considered as the recoverable amount that is 100,000. Once we are cleared, once we have determined the recoverable amount of the asset, we need to compare it with the carrying amount. For asset A, the recoverable amount is 120,000 and the carrying amount is 100,000. It means that no impairment is existing in the case of asset A because the carrying amount is not higher than the recoverable amount, it's still lesser. In the case of asset B, the recoverable amount is 130,000, whereas the carrying amount is 150,000. And in simply mean that the carrying amount is greater than the recoverable amount with $20,000 value. It means that the $20,000 impairment loss is existing in the case of asset B. Let us have a look at asset C now. What is the recoverable amount of asset C? It's $100,000. We need to compare it with the carrying amount of $120,000. And as you can see, that carrying amount is more than the recoverable amount it means that, again, the impairment loss is existing in the case of asset C also. How much? Compare 120,000 with 100,000. There is an impairment loss of $20,000. I hope all of you are clear up to here. Now, students, as we have discussed that at particular intervals, we need to compare the carrying value of an asset with its recoverable amount. What are these suitable intervals? These suitable intervals are the time periods or the circumstances in which we are getting the indicators of impairment from our surroundings which can be present internally in the organization or external to the organization. We need to determine that whether the impairment can exist or not. If any of the circumstances are indicating the impairment chances, then we are going to conduct an impairment review. An impairment review simply means that we are going to compare the carrying amount of an asset with its recoverable amount. Say for example, in the external environment of the organization, if we do see that the market value of an asset is significantly declining, then 
expectation it means that there is an indication of impairment or say for example there are significant changes arising in the technological market economic or legal environment present outside the boundaries of an organization it again means that there are chances that the asset under consideration can become obsolete or outdated over the period of time having an adverse effect on the entity and impairment can exist on the other hand there can be some indicators of impairment which can arise and simply we can know about them by having a look at the internal sources of information those sources of information which are arising inside the boundaries of an organization only say for example if there is a major accident happened to the asset and because of that accident the asset is damaged or say for example there are the evidences arising about the obsolescence of an asset or say for example the way in which the asset is used have been changed so it means that now there are the chances that the carrying amount of an asset will be more than its recoverable amount and the impairment can exist so wherever the indicators of the impairment are coming to our view it means that now we are required to perform the impairment review and we need to compare the carrying amount of an asset to its recoverable amount now students what about annual impairment reviews for assets for normal assets we are going to conduct an impairment review only when the indicators of the impairment are arising but there are some exceptions to this rule say for example in the case of goodwill goodwill which is acquired in a business combination we are not going to wait for the indication of an impairment in the case of acquired goodwill but we are going to conduct an annual impairment review in the case of acquired goodwill on the other hand if we do have an intangible asset with an indefinite useful life we are anyhow going to conduct an impairment review even if there is no indication of impairment arising and one more exception to the rule of impairment indication is an intangible asset which is not yet available for use if there is an asset which is still in a process of getting built up or getting developed which means that it is not yet available for use will be calculated on annual basis for impairment and if there is an impairment existing we have to consider it in our books of accounts now let us have a look that how are we going to recognize and measure the impairment in our books of accounts students if say for example it's the first time that the impairment is existing you are simply going to consider and recognize this impairment loss on the face of your statement of profit or loss immediately just as you that you are comparing the recoverable amount with the carrying amount and you see that carrying amount is more than the recoverable amount of an asset the extra amount the amount over and above needs to be recognized as an impairment loss on the face of the statement of profit or loss but say for example there is an asset which has been revalued upward previously and we had recognized the gain in the statement of other comprehensive income for that particular asset then what are we required to do 
students in that case simply the impairment has forced to be taken to the revaluation surplus until the revaluation gain is fully exhausted and if we are still remaining with more impairment to value the excess will be taken to the statement of profit or loss just a simple example say for example in year 1 your asset has been revalued upward and you had recognized the gain of 20000 dollars in your statement of other comprehensive income in year 2 you see that the carrying amount of an asset is more than the recoverable amount and the impairment loss of 25000 has incurred now 20000 dollars of the impairment loss has to be reversed in statement of other comprehensive income against the gain which has been recorded in the last year and remaining 5000 dollars of the impairment loss has to be recognized on the face of the statement of profit or loss this is what they have mentioned in this slide as well how are we going to reverse an impairment loss let us have a look at this the calculation of the impairment losses is based on predictions of what may happen in future sometimes the actual events turned out to be better than predicted in this happens the recoverable amount is recalculated and previous written down is reversed so sometimes students what happens that the actual circumstances proves to be little bit more favorable than expected an impairment loss actually does not exist so what does that simply means that we have to reverse the impairment loss which has been previously recorded on the basis of our prediction so whenever the assets are impaired we have to review them at each reporting date to say whether there are indications that the impairment has reversed and how are we going to recognize this reversal of the impairment loss a reversal of an impairment loss is recognized immediately as income in the profit or loss when the impairment loss happens for the first time we do recognize it on the face of the sopl and if the reverse happens we are simply going to reverse it on the face of the sopl if the original impairment was charged against the revaluation surplus then what we need to do as discussed earlier say for example the previous asset previously the asset has been revalued upward and now it is getting impaired and we had recorded the impairment in the case of that asset and now we are reversing the impairment loss for the same asset what are we going to do this is what they are telling that if the original amount of the impairment was charged against the revaluation surplus it is then recognized as other comprehensive income and credited to the revaluation surplus so as a summarizing fact you can consider it in your mind that wherever the impairment has been recorded in sopl or the comprehensive income you are going to record a reverse on the same you need to consider one more thing that is written in bullet number 3 the reversal must not take the value of the asset above its depreciated historical cost when we are reversing the impairment loss we need to consider that we cannot take up the amount of an asset at a price which is above its depreciated historical cost if the asset is subsequently measured at the cost model and what does that mean the amount it would have been if the original amount of impairment had never been recorded 
the depreciation that would have been charged in the meantime must be taken into account. So what we are going to do simply, we will be considering the cost of an asset. We will be deducting all of the depreciation which can occur over the period of time, but neglecting the impairment loss. And above that amount, the amount of an asset could not go when we are reversing the impairment loss. And the depreciation charge for the future period should be revised to reflect the changed carrying amount. The future depreciation charges will be revised as per the changed carrying amount of an asset. And obviously we are going to consider that whether the useful life of an asset or the estimate regarding the residual value has changed or not because for calculating depreciation, those estimates should also be considered. Now students, what can be the indicators of the impairment reversal? Obviously, as we have discussed earlier, what can be the indicators of the impairment? They can be arising from the internal surroundings of the organization or the external surroundings of the organization. In the case of impairment reversal also, the indicators can arise from inside the boundaries of an organization or outside the boundaries of an organization. Say for example, the external indicators can be increase in the assets market value. It means that the asset is not expected to be below its recoverable amount. So there is an indication of the impairment reversal. Or say, for example, there are favorable changes in the technological, market, economic, or legal environment. It again means that there are no chances that the asset will be becoming an obsolete one in the near future. Hence, we need to reverse the impairment. On the other hand, the indicators which can arise in the internal environment of the organization can be favorable changes in the use of the asset. Say, for example, the asset has started to give us more benefit. It has started to give more cash inflows to the organization. This favorable change can indicate that now the impairment has to be reversed. Now, my dear students, let us have a look at the case in which the cash generating units are involved. How are we going to recognize the impairment in the case of CGUs, cash generating units? You need to understand first that what actually the cash generating units are. Students, cash generating unit is the smallest identifiable group of assets that generate cash inflows that are largely independent of the cash inflows from other assets. In simple language, you can consider that what is a cash generating unit? Sometimes it is very difficult to determine the value in use, which is arising from the use of a single asset. Sometimes it is very difficult to calculate the cash inflows or outflows which are happening due to the use of a single unit of an asset. And we are only able to identify the value in use of the group of assets in together. So in that case, obviously, we are not able to recognize the impairment separately. What we do do in that case, we are going to combine all those group of assets and do form them as a cash generating unit. And then we do conduct an impairment review for them. And simply we do compare the carrying amount of all the assets which are present in the cash generating unit. And we do compare it with the recoverable amount of the 
assets which are involved in that CGU. The sum of the carrying amount of all the assets in the CGU has to be compared with the sum of the recoverable amount of all the assets in the CGU that is cash generating unit. And now if the carrying amount is more than the recoverable amount, then how are we going to recognize the impairment loss for all the individual assets in the CGU? That is a question. Students, IS 36 says that we need to attribute the impairment loss to a CGU in the order of priority. First, we are going to attribute the impairment loss to the purchased goodwill, if there is any. Once it is expired, then we have to attribute the impairment, remaining impairment loss to all the other assets, including other intangible assets in the CGU on a pro rata basis. It means that on the basis of their carrying amount, we are going to attribute the impairment loss to them. So what is the order of attributing impairment loss in CGU? First, it has to be attributed to the purchased goodwill. Once it is expired, then the remaining impairment loss should be attributed among the remaining assets of the CGU on pro rata basis that is based upon their carrying amounts. Students, we have successfully finished our IS 36. If you do have any more questions, you can simply write your questions and queries in the comment section below. And for sure, I will be replying you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves. Goodbye.